Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, to Isaiah chapter 9, please, Isaiah chapter 9. Just going to read the first two verses of Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> In verse 1 there, you make note that the first difficult name there is Zebulun. The second one is Naphtali. Naphtali might help you as we read that if you know the correct pronunciation, all right? We're going to read those two verses in unison, verses 1 and 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 9. Ready? Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun, and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And let's pray. <clears throat> Father, add your blessing to the reading of these scriptures here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music today. We've enjoyed uh, singing the songs of praise to you. And I pray, Lord, that uh, these songs have come up as a sweet savor to you. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us now as we listen to the special and then ask you to speak to our hearts through the preaching of your word this morning, that, Lord, once again, each of us would give careful attention to your word as it's brought to us. Lord, I pray that during the special as we listen carefully to the words of this song and Lord that you'll help us to be disciplined in our mind and keep our minds from wandering to other places and wondering about other things that would hinder us from hearing what you would want to say to us this morning. And so Lord, use the special to focus us on you and to tune our heart with your heart. And I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With my whole heart I humbly seek you. Now use my life, O oh Lord, I pray. I yield my stubborn will completely. May your commandments light my way. My life, Lord, as yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mine. Rich treasures to find. Give wisdom to choice as I make. Along every path that I take So when I complete life's race Well done, you will say Your word has promised me the victory And now all I need to do is claim Your strength to soar with wings as eagles to walk, to run, and not to faint. My life, Lord, is yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mine. Rich treasures to find. Give wisdom to choice as I make. Along every path that I take, so when I complete life's race, well done, you will say. Amen. <clears throat> now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word today. I want to thank you for the Bible this morning, for allowing us to hold copies of your word in our hands today. Lord, we're asking that 
your word would have its way in each one of our hearts and lives now this morning. I pray for clarity as I bring the message today and Lord for your help as I convey the truth that you've given for us to look at this morning. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for each one that's here this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would go up and down the aisle and in and out of every row. <clears throat> you would stop at every occupied seat. And you'd minister to each individual here this morning. May each of us have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to His church this morning. And we'll thank you in advance what I believe you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the artist paints a winter scene. Snow is blanketing the ground. There are pine trees. Night has fallen and the landscape is enveloped in a semi-darkness. There's a cabin in the shadows. It's really a kind of a gloomy scene. But then the artist uses some yellow and orange and brighter tints and puts a cheerful glow on a lamp and lights the cabin windows. The light, its golden rays reflecting off the snow, completely transforms the impression given by the painting. In contrast to the cold and dark surrounding forest, the light creates a warm feeling of love and security. That's the beauty of a Thomas Kincaid painting. The light is always there. Did you know the first thing that God ever created was light? He said, let there be light. And all through the Bible, as you trace God, you'll find Him associated with light. The psalmist said, He is my light and my salvation. Jesus said, He is the light of the world. When the disciples watched Him on the Mount of Transfiguration, He was transfigured or, or really lit up before them. And He was bright and glistering, the Bible says. I believe He was the light that blinded Saul on the day he got saved on the road to Damascus. For the light that shone that day was above the brightness of the sun. Because it wasn't the S-U-N, it was the S-O-N. The truth is, He's the light of heaven. For the Bible says when we eventually get to heaven and we're in the, the new heaven and the new earth, there's no need for the sun to light it. For the Son of God will light it. There'll never be any nighttime there. I like the hymn that says, How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Stepping in the light. Stepping in the light. Some people say, well, Christianity is just a leap into the dark. I would say quite the opposite. It's a step into the light. And you're those without Christ are the ones walking in darkness. For what is darkness except an absence of light? You walk into a dark room and you don't like it, you can stand there and criticize the darkness all you want, but it's not going to help you. You have to turn on the light. And once you turn on the light, the darkness flees. Now darkness in the Bible always symbolizes a life without God. A life with no spiritual direction. And when you don't have God, you don't have spiritual direction. And so people stumble in the darkness. Living without the knowledge of God and the knowledge of His Word, that's walking in darkness. Now the world as they walk, walk means you take repeated steps in the dark. There's three kinds of, of darkness that I want to talk to you about. And then I'll talk about the light. There's mental and intellectual darkness. In Romans chapter 1, the Bible says that the world professes themselves to be wise and they become fools because they're rejecting God. 
they would not accept Him as God. Man chooses to walk in darkness. Because if they step into the light, it exposes them for the sinner they are. John chapter 3 and verse 19. John 3 and verse 19. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Truthfully, man has always sought the answer to three questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? The world doesn't have any good answers to any of those questions. To say, who am I? Or what am I here for? They would basically say that you're nobody special. In fact, you just kind of happened. And there's no real purpose for you being here. And you're going nowhere. That when you die, you simply will cease to exist. That's what the world will say. And so you better live it up while you're here. And I would submit to you, that's not light, that's darkness. There's no hope in that. People have no direction. People don't know where their life is headed. Unless there's some lighthouse that would show them, here's the way. Here's the way. If you're here this morning, and you can answer those three questions, who am I, what am I what's my purpose here, and where am I going, you know, you're, you're ahead, you are further ahead than many PhDs in the world. Those are great questions to know. By the way, who am I? I'm a direct, special creation of God. Judy's here this morning, and soon they'll welcome a baby boy into the world. I saw a cute little picture of a little fella stretched out, and he said, I'm glad they let me out. I was running out of womb. <laughs> and uh, I thought about that, Judy, and you probably feel that way too. Don't you? All the women said, Amen. But the Bible says I formed that God forms them in the belly. God forms them in the womb. <clears throat> a special creation of God made in His image. I'm spirit, soul, and body. And I'm made for the distinct purpose of bringing glory to God. That's why I'm here. And, and listen, I can't do that if I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All fall short of that mark no matter how much good I do, no matter how nice I am, no matter how much money to charity I give, none of that will matter. I cannot bring glory to God until I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now that I become a child of God, I'm instructed that whether I eat or drink or whatsoever I do, I do all to the glory of God. Now I'm able to bring glory to God. You don't just get saved so you don't go to hell. Oh, don't get me wrong. That's a wonderful benefit. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not going to go to hell. I'm glad I can't go to hell. It would be impossible for me to go to hell. Hallelujah. I'm saved. My sins are forgiven. Christ has paid my debt. I'll never go to hell. But that's not why He saved me. He saved me to bring glory to Him. To bring glory, to bring glory means to bring a good opinion of or to make someone else look good. You know why you're saved? To make God look good. Are you fulfilling the purpose for which God saved you? Do you make God look good? See, it's not about making you look good. Making me look good. It's about making Him look good. And then, of course, where am I going? Well, I know I'm going to heaven. And everybody has an eternal soul that's going to live somewhere forever. And you'll either live in the enjoyment and the wonderful atmosphere and in the presence of God and Jesus Christ in a place called heaven, or you'll suffer alone in the darkness and the torments 
in the eternal fire of hell. But you'll live somewhere forever. <clears throat> it's interesting how <clears throat> man refuses to understand that. Have you ever seen a, a model built of our solar system? Anybody ever seen that? People build these models and all the planets and all the stuff. And, and no one ever looked at one of those and said, well, I wonder how that came about. You know somebody made that model. Somebody fashioned those planets and fashioned the sun and, and they, they did all that. Nobody questions that. How can you not question that and look at the real thing and say it just happened? If the model had a designer, then the real thing had to have a designer. And to say otherwise, you're being willfully and mentally wanting to be in intellectual darkness. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. Why is it that people don't want to believe in creation? They're willingly ignorant. They want to be mentally and intellectually in darkness. But there's a second darkness <clears throat> that men will have, and that is moral darkness. I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians with me, please. Ephesians chapter 4, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, then the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> the Bible says, notice with me verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 4. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding, what's the word? Darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. <clears throat> who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is looseness. It's literally an indulgence in animal desires. To work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard Him and been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. You notice the moral darkness that the world is in. The looseness. The world calling evil good and good evil. The scandals that we hear each and every day that comes across our news. We're surrounded by people described in these verse, e verses each and every day. You, you cannot watch a television program without seeing immorality. You can't even watch a sporting event and not see immorality during commercials. It is a corrupt society. We're in a moral darkness. Now you understand the Bible makes it pretty clear light and darkness don't mix. You can't have both. Light will take care of the darkness. They're not tolerant one of another. When somebody says we got to be tolerant, that may be politically correct, but it is not morally right. We cannot tolerate sin. We cannot tolerate things that God says are wrong. We don't tolerate those things. You see, what we believe affects how we behave. Belief affects our behavior. We are our children, we have taken God who is light and we have removed Him from the classroom. We've taken the Word of God which is light 
and removed it from the public instruction in our classrooms. And so our children now are in darkness and we wonder why they walk in darkness. We wonder why we have the corruption and the immorality and the no morals that, and no one has a right compass of what's right and what's wrong. And nobody listens to authority. And nobody wants to be told what to do. We wonder what's happened in our society. Well, we remove the light. That's what happened. We wonder why they're in darkness. Mental darkness, intellectual darkness, moral darkness, and then we know, number three, there's spiritual darkness. People say that there's no personal God or maybe there's a God of their imagination. A lot of people have a God who they've made Him up to be in their mind. We mentioned in our Sunday school class this morning how name and thought how it would be. A lot of people just, they don't, they don't know the God of the Bible, they know the God who they've thought Him up to be in their mind. And that's when they get expressions like, well, I don't think God would do this, or I don't think God's concerned about this, or I don't think, and you know what? the whole reason God gave us a book was so we don't have to just give our thoughts about it. Because we have His Word about it. And so what we think or what we, our, our minds come up with really doesn't matter. <clears throat> it's interesting, the New Age movement talks a lot about light. But it's not the true light. When I hear them talk about light, I'm reminded of the verse where the Bible says that Satan himself could be transformed into an angel of light. And so be careful if somebody just talks about the light and they're not referring to Jesus Christ. Because that's not the true light. Churches today sometimes will talk about Jesus being the light, but they're basing their beliefs on philosophy or psychiatry or other worldly paradigms and maybe traditions instead of the Lamb of God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Would you turn there please? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Just go to your left from Ephesians. Go to Galatians and then you should find 2 Corinthians and chapter 4 please. Notice what the verse says here. <clears throat> chapter 4 and verse 6. The Bible says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Colossians 1 and verse 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Ephesians 5.11 Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So we understand that man is spiritually dark. That's why our job, listen, our job is not to stand up and just curse the darkness. It's not going to do a whole lot of good to take someone who's in the dark and just tell them how dark they are. They know they're dark. They know they're stumbling around. What they need is the light. That's why the Bible says, go into all the world and preach the Gospel. The Gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're preaching to them Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Why? He's light. And people in darkness are drawn to the light. It's, it's plain as can be. So, there's the three kinds of darkness. And I want to I tell you today, that God has deposited light in three places. So we have the darkness, and now we have the light. We're, there are three places God has placed His light. The first place God places His light is in the Scriptures. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We don't quite understand that in our day because anywhere you go, there's lights. In fact, it's, it's rare sometimes, most of the, uh, many in this room and many of us who are city people, you don't know what it's like to look up at the stars. You don't get to see many of them because the lights of the city drown that out. How many of you grew up out in the country? When it got dark, it got dark. 
And you looked up, and man, the sky is filled with stars. It's incredible the amount of stars you'll see because of the light. So we don't, we don't quite get darkness because it's rarely, real, it's rarely very dark. Because you walk outside, there's street lights. You go in the parking lot, there's lights in the parking lot. And so we don't understand. But in those days, you understand, if they went out at night after dark, it was dark. And so they would have, they would put lamps, oil lamps, little ones, on their feet. And they would walk to be able to illuminate their next step. It's a light under my path. That's, that's the only way they would venture out to be able to do that. If you, you could go without it, but you don't know what you're going to run into. You know, there's not many good things happen when you walk in the dark. Ask your little toe. Say, so what's a little toe for? It's for detecting the corners of furniture in the dark. That's what it's for. So there's the, a lamp under my feet, a light under my path. The Bible is our moral compass. The Bible is our instruction manual. The Bible's our map to find a way around in a lost and a confusing world. Now, turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. Would you turn there, please? 2 Peter chapter 1. We have dealt with this passage when we talked about Peter on a Wednesday evening in the study on the disciples. God is shown us that He's deposited His light in the Bible, in the Scriptures. Peter here is talking about in verse 16 that he hasn't followed cunningly devised fables, chapter 1, verse 16 of Second Peter. We were eyewitnesses of His majesty, verse 16. Because he, he said, He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with Him in the holy mount. Talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, and Peter said, we heard the voice of God. That's pretty, pretty awesome. Pretty amazing to hear the audible voice of God. But wait. Notice what he writes in verse 19. We have also a more sure Word of prophecy. Well, what, what can be more sure than the audible voice of God? The written Word of God. That's exactly right. That's why he said in verse 21, The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now I want you to back up though to verse 19. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. Hey, you do well if you listen to God's Word. If you do what God's Word says. Notice, has unto a what? Light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and day star rise your eyes. He says, you take heed to the Word of God just like it was a light in a dark place. i got news for you. The world's a dark place. And the only way you're going to navigate through this world is with the light. And that's the Scriptures. You do well that you take heed to the Word of God. Take heed to the Bible to navigate your way through the darkness. That's why Jesus, if you recall, when He was in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and, uh, Mary and Martha were sitting at his feet, and then Martha realized it's probably time to eat. And she gets up and starts rattling around in the kitchen, you know, preparing a meal. And the, the rattling gets a little louder, and the dishes get a little clangier, if that's a word. And, and she's a little upset because Mary's still sitting in there. And finally, she's had enough, and she tells Jesus. Don't you think she ought to come help me? Now, that's not the Bible version. That's the slave ball version, okay? But he said, don't you think she ought to come help me out? And Jesus, remember? Martha, Martha, you're cumbered about many things. You're troubled about many things. Mary hath chosen the good part. See, what was the good part? Listening to the words of Jesus Christ. Now, 
We don't have to listen to Him audibly speak to us. He's written down His words for us. What's the good part? Listening to God's Word. What's the good part? What's the necessary part for you and me? Listening to God's Word. Oh, we're no different. There's Martha in all of us. You wake up in the morning and either way your brain says, oh, i got this to do and i got this to do and i got to get this done and i got to call this person and i got to get this person and what's happening on Facebook? And we neglect the needful part. We neglect the part we got to have to navigate through a dark world. There's the light right there. There's the light. And what happens is we're in darkness and we have no idea where we're going. So you know what we do? We, we don't go to light ourselves, so we try to ask everybody else and hope they have some light that they can help us. Well, I don't know what I should do about this. What do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? I know. Pastor, what do you think I should do? We're just asking anybody else, can you shed some light on this? Because I'm in darkness. Every single time we've had someone in our you that ends up stumbling or straying, Brother Bob always talks to him and asks them, have you been journaling every day? Been in your Bible every day? You know what the answer always is? No. No. Well, no wonder. No wonder you're in the darkness. No wonder you have no idea and you have to talk to everybody else trying to get help. Nothing wrong with getting counsel. Nothing wrong with getting advice. I'm not preaching against that. But I'm saying don't only do that after you've been in this. That, hey, that, I got the same book you got. There's not any special notes in here for pastors. Okay? No special notes in here for for teachers, it's just God's Word. And God wants to show it to you as much as He wants to show it to me. It's a light. God's Word. You see, if all you get of the Bible, if all you get of the light is on Sunday morning, it ain't going to last very long. If all you do is give God an hour on Sunday morning, your, your, your light isn't going to shine very long. Most of you watch television more than that in one night. I mean, it's only an hour and a half sermon on Sunday morning. <laughs> Xavier says, come on, and all the visitors went. <laughs> I've been on vacation. I'm going to let her know. No, I'm not. I won't. I'm mindful of your time. teacher told her Sunday school class that she'd give them homework the week before. They were to read Isaiah 9. When she got there next week, she asked how many have read Isaiah 9 and every hand in the class went up. Wonderful. We can have a great discussion. She asked, do you remember the second verse? A few of the youngsters began rustling through their Bibles trying to find Isaiah. And the teacher said, I'll give you help. The people that walked in darkness, and still there was quiet, no answer. And then she said, well, I'll sweeten the, I'll sweeten the offer. I'll give you a candy bar to whoever can answer. Complete the verse. The people that walked in darkness, and immediately answers begin to come. The people that walk in darkness use less electricity. The people that walk in darkness stub their toe a lot. The people that walk in darkness spend most of their time sleeping. Or the people that walk in darkness are usually burglars. But about that time, somebody found Isaiah 9 and they just read it. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. And they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And if you, read the, if you continue reading in Isaiah chapter 9, you come to verse number 6. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. 
And His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's talking about the light of the world that would come into the world, which was Jesus Christ. The Bible is God's light that always leads you to Jesus Christ. It helps us to live as Jesus would have us live. It, it, it opens our eyes to how Jesus would live and want us to live. You'll never figure it out if you neglect the Bible. So he's put his light in the Scriptures. Secondly, he put his light, as we just mentioned, in the Savior. Look at John chapter 9. In fact, we'll look at several verses in the Gospel of John. If you want to turn there, please. John 9. In fact, we'll, we'll pick them up in order. Let's go all the way back to John 1, will you? We'll start and do them in order. It'll be easier for you that way, I think. You know, John 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now I want you to look at John chapter 8, would you please? John chapter 8. In verse number 12 of John 8, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, take repeated steps in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Notice John 9 and verse 5. I believe Brother Moreland was here last week in John 9. Notice what Jesus said in verse 5, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Look at John 12. John 12, please. Verse number 35. <clears throat> then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Skip down to verse 46. Jesus said, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. The songwriter said the whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. There's nothing in this world to keep you from Him. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light. It is shining for thee. Sweetly the light hath shined upon me. Come to the light. That's what you do when you go out into a dark world. What are you doing? You're lifting up Jesus Christ. He's the light. At some point, people get tired of the darkness. They get weary of no direction and no purpose and no reason for being here. Jesus changes all that. And He gives them the light that they're looking for. So don't just go and curse the darkness Go and preach Jesus Christ. Lift up the light and men will come. So God has deposited the light in the Scriptures. He, despite it, he has deposited the light in the Savior. And i got news for you. He's deposited the light in the saints. That's you and me. He's deposited the light in us. Jesus said, we read it earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, when He said He commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Paul said one of the great mysteries is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If Jesus Christ is the light, 
and Christ is in me, then He's got to shine through. He's got to shine out. It's not my light. When the Bible says, let your light so shine before men, it's not my light. It's the light that's in me. That's Jesus Christ. He's to shine through us. So he says we're reflecting His light. I don't think we're reflecting. I think, I think our life ought to be like a clear glass globe that the light shines through. Let Him be seen. It's an awful dark place if Jesus doesn't shine through you. When He told those fishermen that He's the light of the world, I am is the emphasis there. Meaning I and I alone am the light of the world. And it's interesting because the Greeks were known as the enlightened ones. Not these common fishermen guys. That would be an insult to the Greeks. A stumbling block, if you will. So Jesus would tell His disciples that you alone are the light of the world. I'm depositing my light in you for you to go out and shine to the world. The world's a dark place. Somebody says, well, I'm the only Christian at my job. Hallelujah! Somebody's there with light. Let your light shine. How dark would that place be if you weren't there? God places people in those positions. Why? So your light will shine. And they'll see Jesus in you. That's what it's for. He's inside of us. A Hindu trader in India once asked the missionary, what, what do you put on your face to make it shine? With kind of a surprised look, the missionary said, I, I don't put anything on it. Sorry, sorry, Avon. <laughs> this wasn't happening. Mary Kay wasn't going on. The questioner began to lose patience and said emphatically, yes, you do. All of you who believe in Jesus seem to have it. I've seen it in the towns of Agra and Surat and even in the city of Bombay. And suddenly the Christian understood. And he said, now I know what you mean and I'll tell you the secret. It's not something we put on from the outside. It's something that comes from the inside. It's the, it's, it's the light of God shining from our heart. Remember when, remember when Moses came down from the mountain having spent 40 days with God? Remember the people couldn't look at him. Why? His face shone so much. He had to put a veil over his face just so they could listen to what he had to say. We're not the light. We represent the light. We let the light shine in us. In the old days... A little boy watched a man come down the street to light the street lamps. And he looked over at his parents and he said, Look, there's someone poking holes in the darkness. I thought that's a pretty good description of what a Christian ought to do. We ought to poke some holes in the darkness of this world. That's a grand description of somebody who walks in the light. We ought to leave church on Sunday and go out into the world. And by the way, when you got saved, you know what happened? You, you poked a hole in the darkness. Now there's a light where there used to be darkness. Why don't we, why don't we go this week and poke some holes in the darkness? Let, let Jesus be seen in us. Let's, let's walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You see, that's what He's looking for. Light and darkness. And those in the darkness are always drawn to the light. We are the light of the world. So let's shine as lights. Let's, let's, listen, don't allow 
the things of the world. Don't allow sin. Don't allow selfishness to cloud your globe and not allow the light to shine through very brightly. Okay? I want my light to be as bright as it possibly can. And then men will be drawn to that light. Not drawn to me. Not drawn to you. They're drawn to Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. Let's be lights in the dark world. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the contrast we see throughout Scripture. It's been not an easy thing to try to crunch this down into just 30 minutes of time or so on a Sunday morning. Such a great contrast throughout the Bible between light and dark. And Lord, I, I, I just get the picture that we are not in darkness, we're in light. We are children of light, not children of dark. And so Lord, help us to walk in the light, take repeated steps in the light. Father, I pray that we'd understand this world is in darkness. That we are not in the land of the living, going to the land of the dying. We are in the land of the dying, going to the land of the living. While we're around this world where death is everywhere and darkness is everywhere, may we shine as lights for you. May the beauty of Jesus be seen in us. May we let our light so shine before men They'll see those good works and they'll glorify our Father which is in heaven. As Jesus is lifted up, may all men be drawn unto Him. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Pastor, there was a day when I was in darkness. I was in the darkness of sin. But I saw the light. My blinded eyes were opened and I saw Jesus was the way to heaven. Jesus was the way to forgive my sin and for me to walk in the light. The light of forgiveness. The light of eternal life. And I called on the Lord Jesus and I asked Him to be my Savior. And Pastor, I know for sure today if I died I'd go to heaven. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment if that's your case today? Say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. Okay, you may put it down. Is there somebody here today who would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I don't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I've ever trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Would you let me pray for you? We'll not call you out or embarrass you, but I'll pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me this morning? Is there someone like that? Don't think I saw anybody's hand who didn't go up. Light and darkness. I wonder how many believers here this morning would say, Pastor, I, I want the light of Jesus to be seen clearly in my life. Maybe, maybe you've been bemoaning the fact you're in a dark place. Bemoaning the fact about where you live or where you work or your family you're in and you're wondering about the, the, the darkness that's around you. But you are the light. God has placed you there. Let the the brightness of Jesus be seen through you. I wonder how many believers here today would say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart tonight, or this morning, that He has deposited His light in His Word, in His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and in me, in us. And I need to walk in the light as He is in the light.